Less um, with us uh, tonight for this forum are uh, contested primaries. Um, so we have a long, uh, number of candidates here from contested primaries. There was a we have a little bit of problem. We have a problem. Yes. One of our rules is that in order to be a part of any of our forums, you have to complete a questionnaire. Did you no. complete a questionnaire? No. We have. Then I'm sorry you can't participate. Oh, I didn't participate. <laughs> that was a very strong rule. Okay. So you have, to, you have to answer a questionnaire to be able to participate. Um, so we will go ahead and get started. Uh, we will have one minute to answer questions. We're going to start with the introductions. We're going to start on this end. And the same as the judicial forum, we'll then do a round robin type of format where uh, I'll ask a question and Chuck will answer the first question first on down the line to Andrea, so on and so forth. It's like musical debate format. Uh, I, I was wondering, did we get notice that you had to do the questionnaire because I don't remember that. Yeah, either. And I just think participation is so important. You know, I really would not challenge the person moderating the <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm just asking, or I'm just asking, or are we already on? Are we already started? We're yeah. starting. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Andrea Olson for House District 100. <laughs> uh, we would like to start with introductions. Go ahead and inter introduce yourself. You may choose to stand or not. It's pretty proud. Okay, I'm Andrea Olson, and yes, I do believe in participation as a lifelong resident of House District 100 and a fifth generation Montanan. Um, I'm running because I love Missoula and I love Montana, and I am concerned about the future of our communities and our state. I developed at an early age an interest and capacity to help people, um, which is why I did become an attorney. I'm proud to say that I worked on social justice issues and represented hundreds of people that are the diver diversity of my district. Um, over the last 25 years. Uh, seniors, working people, people with this, all of these are working people actually, people with disabilities, veterans, tribal members and consumers, and students. I still carry their experience deep within my heart, which fuels my desire uh, to uh, step up and work, uh, my, uh, and work as a legislator to make government work better for people. For the last four sessions of the Montana Legislature, I advocated on behalf of workers' rights, um, trying to protect their access to health care benefits, uh, consumer rights, and the constitutional rights of all Montana. Oh. Well, I guess uh, that's the end of my introduction. <laughs> we'll move on to Chuck Erickson. I apologize. I would like to add before, uh, before Chuck begins, um, I would like to say that we have a you have questions that you would like to ask that aren't directed at one particular candidate, it's a general question, um, feel free to write them down on a piece of paper and pass them to Charlie in the blue shirt. Um, raise your hand if you need a piece of paper to ask the question. I would take questions. Chuck Erickson, also for House District 100. My name is Chuck Erickson. I'm running for House District 100. I'm a Missoula area native with roots going back seven generations. I went to Franklin grade school too, and I went to Hellgate and Sentinel. After I graduated from high school, I enlisted in the Navy and served as a Navy diver. I'm a Vietnam veteran. I served in Vietnam as a diver and on the REACT team in base security. When I came back from the service, I started the first search and rescue dive team for the Sheriff's Office under Sheriff John Moe. I'm a 32nd, uh, 43 year retired member of Local 459 Plumbers and Pipe Fitters Union. I served, was active in, in the union. I served on every committee they had, most notably the negotiating committee where we sat down and negotiated contracts that were acceptable to both labor and management. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> you keep waving that like it's coming up. <laughs> Actually, <you're doing> My name is Nate McConnell, and I'm running for House District 89. Um, and I'm running for 
basically for three simple reasons. Number one, to expand Medicaid. Uh, number two, to fully fund early childhood education. And number three, uh, to preserve our outdoor heritage. I'm the only candidate in House District 89 who's earned the uh, uh, endorsement of the Montana Conservation Voters. I'm very proud of that. Um, I've also earned endorsements from former legislators like Ron Erickson, uh, and Betsy Hands, um, and I look forward to going to going to Helena and fighting for those uh, values that those people have instilled, and for the uh, people of House District 89. And I look forward to doing so. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, my name is Sam Thompson. I'm running for HD89. I'm a graduating student here at the university, uh, and that's something that I think gives me a, a really fresh and forward-looking perspective uh, on a lot of the issues. Uh, you know, two big issues for me uh, are investing in clean, renewable energy. That's something that I think is just common sense. Uh, we have a huge potential to grow for in the state. Uh, another one is starting new small businesses. Uh, that's something that I would like to do, and I think a lot of Montanans do. And so we need to make it easier for people to start new small businesses. Uh, Montana has a great history. You know, we have something like uh, 700,000 uh, small businesses in the state, and we need to keep improving upon that. Uh, you know, I, despite my young age, I do have a bit of experience. I was able to work up in the last legislative session uh, as an intern uh, and, and really fight for clean energy issues and develop a deep-seated passion for a lot of these issues. Uh, so. I, I also like to say I balanced the budget uh, with the student government here, uh, and, and I'd like to we, we finish with a surplus this year, and that's something I'd like to take up to Helena. So, thank you. Hi, I'm Diane Sands. I'm running for Senate District 49, which is a new district that was created. So it goes all the way to River Valley County, all the way to the Idaho border, all the way around Mineral County, picks up Target Range, Orchard Homes, and half the blocks between Russell and Reserve. So it's quite a huge district, and it's a new district, and I'm really pleased to say that the former senators who represented in this district, Senator Watson Reed and Senator Cliff Larson, are, are very strong supporters of mine. I have served in the legislature for eight uh, uh, years, four terms, and served as a lobbyist for the Montana Women's Lobby for a decade before that. So I bring a lot of experience to working on the issues that are important and people keep bringing up, things such as Medicaid expansion, I chaired the Interim Committee on Children and Families, Health and Human Services. I know how to make that system work. I'm used to working with Republicans and getting things done in Helena, and I look forward to doing it uh, for four years should I be elected, and I ask for your vote. Hello, my name is Greg Strandberg, and I'm running for House District 98. Uh, I think we need to have legislators going to Helena that are ready to work with the other party to get things done that we need. We need to have sound, conservative economic policies that make sure our state is going forward on a firm footing so it can continue well into the future. But we need to be funding these social programs that we need for the current uh, generation right now. And I think we can uh, make a lot of great deals in the legislature next year that ensures we have things like the Medicare expansion that we need so our hospitals here in Missoula and also our rural hospitals across the state have what they need to go forward. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to come and meet everybody and um, share some of my views and reasons for running. My name is Heather Cahoon and like Greg and also Willis, I'm running for House District 98. Um, I'm a member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes. I'm a teacher at the university and teach for the Native American Studies Department. I have a PhD with research and policy focusing international law treaties, um, basically the history of American Indians in American um, government. Uh, as a parent, um, I have two little kids, and as a parent and an educator and also the wife of a small business owner, um, some of the things I care most about are adequate funding of public education and also preserving and protecting our environment for future generations. Hello, I'm Willis Curdy. I'm a, can a candidate for House District 98. Um, I'm a 30-year uh, educator here in Missoula. I uh, was a smoke jumper for 30 years. I've been in a wildlife, a wildland fire program for 38 years. I'm a small business owner. I have a flight instruction business and help run our family farm. I've been, uh, um, I've been endorsed by Senator Watson Reed, Senator Larson, Representative Squires, 
uh, Montana Conservation Voters and MEA MFT. I have a lot of work working with uh, MEA MFT. I was a lobbyist, or not a lobbyist, I chaired MEA MFT's uh, legislative committee for over 11 years. Um, other times I also uh, lobbied uh, for the association. And as a classroom teacher, I encourage my students to get involved in uh, our political system because it is um, an opportunity for them to grow and express themselves. And if you look around the legislature and state government, you will see those students here. And you see one at the end of the table here. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Our first question, uh, what are your priorities in the legislature if you are elected? Priorities in the legislature if you are elected. And I believe we're, um, we're supposed to have pens and paper up there, so I'm going to ask Pam, would you please distribute those real quick? Because people like to jot down their thoughts when they think about questions. Um, and we'll try to have them for the candidates. So I'll just let her distribute them while you collect your thoughts, Chuck, you get a bit of a deep breath before you have to answer the question. We'll start with Chuck and go down to the table and end with you. One of my main priorities, being an HBAC contractor, is to see if we can set up a state fund of some type to help the communities upgrade the infrastructure in their school systems. I've spent the last 25 years doing HBAC service work. And as an example, Franklin School where Andrea and I went to school, 1916 still has the original boiler, an old coal-fired boiler that was converted to a gas boiler in the 50s. That boiler functions at about 50% efficiency, so 50 cents out of every heating dollar goes right up the stack. I would like to see this equipment updated to where we can use the money for our schools in the future for, for uh, classroom use and not waste it into the atmosphere. As I mentioned earlier, um, the three things that I, I really think that the next legislative session that we can do, um, the first one is we got to expand Medicaid. Um, 70,000 people in our state don't have health insurance. Montanans have paid for it, um, and we should use it for our fellow citizens. Um, secondly, um, Governor Bullock and Lieutenant Governor McLean have a proposal for funding education that I think merits, if you guys haven't seen it, I think. You should take a look at it. It's a great proposal, and I think it should pass in the next session um, with bipartisan support. And then the third thing is um, I'm a participant in, outdoor, in our outdoor heritage. Um, as I've said um, in other forums, uh, I'm a hunter, not very well, uh, not very good, but uh, in a, in an angler. And, and public access to public lands, I think, is vital. Um, and I think there should be something to see when you get there. So those are the three things I would, I would work on. Yeah, uh, Sam Thompson for uh, HD89 again. Uh, again, I think clean energy is a, is a huge, should be a huge priority for the state. Uh, it's all well and good to protect uh, our public spaces, but when they're shot to crap and there's no animals to hunt out there, it's not really gonna do us any good. Uh, so we need to make sure that we're uh, divesting away from uh, last century's fossil fuel-based economies and really looking forward the, towards the future. Uh, you know, we have a huge wind-based uh, resource here that, that we haven't really tapped. Uh, we have something like the second highest energy potential for wind and we're only 18th in production, so we've got huge strides we can make with that. Uh, another big priority I didn't mention earlier is uh, the crushing burden of student debt uh, for higher education. A college degree just simply isn't what it used to be. Uh, and a, a lot of politicians can come up and tell you that they're, they're gonna fight for students' interests. I, I'm a graduating student myself. I'm living in debt right now. I, I, I know firsthand what that burden is. Uh, and, and that's something that I would like to see the state alleviate. Well, I know what committees I work on and what I can get done, so I'm pretty focused in what I want to do. Medicaid expansion is critical. I helped start Partnership Health Center here as a legislator, uh, led an effort to expand 
uh, community health centers across the state, which are for people who don't have insurance, exactly the audience of people that Medicaid expansion is targeted to, so I expect to work on that. Secondly, pay equity. Um, that issue is critical to me. I've worked on it for several decades and have chaired the Democratic Women Legislators in our agenda, which is to expand med uh, pay equity in a variety of ways. Um, and third, as the Vice Chair of Judiciary Committee, I expect to again serve on judiciary, which really is where we defend our fundamental constitutional rights. And I expect to put my skills and my history into doing exactly that, making sure that all people are treated equally and that we do not um, go off to the crazy end as we have in the past in legislative sessions. So those would be my three personal priorities. Well, one of my first priorities when I get to the legislature is to listen to what the Republicans have to say in Helena because I'm pretty convinced they're going to be in the majority next time. We're going to have to listen to them to see what they think. And also I want to listen to what they have to say about resource extraction in this state because I'm pretty convinced we need to find new ways to do business here and 50 years from now, if we're still arguing over digging coal out of the ground, oh, we got some problems. And then the next thing I want to do is I want to listen to voters because just because we're elected, it doesn't mean we need to stop listening to you guys. And especially, we need to get you up there to Helena to these committee meetings. That I would push to do another is to reassess the current funding for public education um, and to try to develop more and um, additional and more innovative ways of generating funding for that. And the final one is to protect our environment from irreparable damage. Okay, as a classroom teacher, again, like I said, 30 years, education is uh, my number one priority. We need a highly skilled, highly educated, highly motiv motivated workforce. It only comes through a quality program that starts hopefully at the pre-K program, so long as we make sure we take care of first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, and so on as well, uh, up through graduate school. Uh, we will not work as a state without that highly skilled, highly motivated, highly articulated workforce. And that's where it comes, number one, right from our schools. Secondly, those highly educated, highly educated, highly educated, highly motivated workers will be will be our top small business leaders in Montana. Montana is a state of small businesses. We need to make them work. This is where we've grown jobs in the last 30, 40 years, and we need to keep it going. Small businesses are the key. Okay, and third is Medicaid expansion. Okay, we need a healthy workforce, uh, a workforce that's productive, and on top of that, Medicaid expansion will bring hundreds, maybe thousands of jobs to the state Highly, qual highly paid jobs that this state really needs bad. Um, there are so many issues that need to be addressed, but I am um, very much following in uh, Representative Squires, who's represented our district for 30 years as a senator and as a representative, and I will continue to defend workers' rights, their access to um, health care, and um, the benefits that they deserve. Um, I'm very passionate about all human rights. I believe that health care is a human right. In addition to working very hard in expanding Medicare, Medicare, uh, the Medicaid expansion, I will also do what I can to protect um, the health care benefits for seniors um, and, ex and expand um, those kinds of things, those kinds of accesses. In addition, um, I believe that we need to uh, come together to really face the future and develop sustainable development jobs and in doing so in order to protect the environment uh, that we all are, it's, that's necessary for all of us to sustain the life that we live here. Thank you. Thanks. The next question will start with me. Shoot. Correct? Yep. Okay. Uh, what successes have you had in getting legislation passed previously with the Montana legislature? Um, this could be either by being a previous representative or as uh, an advocate in front of the legislature, a citizen in front of the legislature with an interest in front of the legislature. Any previous successes? 
experiences you've had with getting legislation passed previously? I have no experience in government, <clears throat> but I do have a lot of experience in the courtroom. I'm a solo practitioner attorney. Um, I, I'm the only one in this race who actively, um, well, aside from Andrea, um, who interprets and, and has to argue the laws that are passed in the Montana State Legislature. One of them, I think, that, that requires, uh, uh, just to underscore something that uh, Representative Sands has mentioned, is pay equity. That's it. I, I practice a lot of employment and discrimination law. People who get terminated from their jobs for, through no fault of their own, um, people, women primarily, who end up homeless. Those are things that I think, those are laws that we need to uphold. Those are, those are values that we need to extend. Um, I think they should be extended to people um, in the LBGT community. Um, and I think that's, that's a perspective I can bring because I know exactly how those laws apply to everyday citizens. Uh, again, uh, Sam Thompson, uh, House District 89. Uh, during the last legislative session, it was mostly defense on my part. Uh, unfortunately, now uh, clean energy has become a partisan issue. I don't think it is one. Uh, it just makes economic sense. Uh, that being said, there were a lot of attacks on the renewable energy standard. standard excuse me. Uh, and uh, through my internship up there uh, as a lobbyist with Mont Perg, uh, I'd say we're actually very successful in beating down a lot of the bad uh, environmental legislation. Uh, now to end on a happier note, uh, I did uh, some work alongside Asa Homan, who was the ASUM lobbyist up there at the time. Uh, and we, we did a lot of work on securing uh, the tuition freeze uh, through the Montana University school system. Uh, so we'll just end on a little optimistic note there. Well, I've spent a lot of years up there and worked on a lot of bills, so there's a lot to choose from. In my lobbying days with the women's lobby, we did everything from pass equal pay for comparable worth, which bills on the 1919 Equal Pay Law of the state of Montana. We passed non-gender insurance that prohibited discrimination against people based on gender or marriage in all forms of insurance. Um, in addition, bad child care legislation, protection of reproductive rights, etc. As a legislator, in well, my last session, I actually passed more pieces of legislation than all but one other legislator, and he had all the DUI bills. So I've done everything from money for um, state parks, $280,000 for Traveler's Rest, and I'm working with uh, the state parks people to find a new revenue stream to support our state parks. I've also worked on a lot of things such as finding uh, a little slush fund of money within the Department of Transportation to fund emergency medical services. This is our sixth year. There have been $6 million that have gone out to small volunteer EMS programs across the state that have really saved lives. When you're out driving the highways and you need someone to come out there and get you, it's EMS that's going to do it. So I have a very long record, and those are just a few of them. All right, well, I have no elected experience, but back in 2001, I was working in the legislative session as a printer, printing all the bills down in the basement. And one day we had a bill came through, and it was a bill to legalize industrial hemp, which is something that farmers can use to grow all kinds of different crops for, you know, make rope and industrial uses. So I thought that sounds like a pretty good idea, another way we'd give farmers a business tool to get new goods to the market. So I got up in front of the Senate Agricultural Committee, which had some rising political stars like uh, Corey Stapleton and John Tester in it at the time. And I gave him my little speech about legalizing industrial hemp. And halfway through, John Tester got up to go to the water cooler to fill up his cup. So I figured it was really going downhill. But thankfully, I guess it was, it was just bored and it already decided which way to vote, which was yes, and the bill passed. So maybe I have something to do with that. And I think I can do the same thing in Helena next year. Thanks. So can you read the question one more time? What past successes have you had with getting legislation passed either as a past representative or as a citizen with interests in front of the legislature? Okay, so that would be as the latter. It's just a citizen with interests in front of the legislature. Um, and that would be the 2005 funding um, of Indian Ed for All. Um, as a student, a tribal member, and also um, a teacher at the university, I went before um, a state senate committee. Um, it, it was, you know, just an open floor 
discussion of, you know, is funding this important, and if so, why, and how much, et cetera. And it was a very meaningful experience for me, and I'm pleased to say that in 2005, the state did fund Indian Ed for all. Okay, as uh, the chair of the MBA's legislative committee, I worked a lot with funding issues, the legislature, and of course, we had the opportunity every two years to go after the legislature and ask for more money for schools, and in most cases, were successful. Also, played a special role in guaranteeing just cause and due process for teachers, um, so they wouldn't be arbitrarily fired um, from their positions. Uh, we also worked. I also worked really hard at raising the minimum wage in Montana through our program. And as the chair of the Missoula Rural Fire District Board of Trustees, also played a very key role in working with the legislature to implement new equipment for our state firefighters to uh, protect them uh, on the job. And finally, um, we helped work to, to de devise and pair our volunteer retirement, or retirement program for volunteer firefighters in the city of Montana, which is now law. Throughout the years, I have advocated on many different issues from advocating for the repeal of the Sexual Deviant Conduct Statute to um, um, lending my voice to uh, uh, keeping non-gender insurance that was passed uh, 30 years ago now, I think, 25 anyway, 25 years ago. Um, I was recently part of a coalition that successfully passed the payday lending. Um, and as an individual who reads bills, I guess one of the things that I did myself was um, get a bill that was going to require us all to buy prepaid life insurance, uh, prepaid funeral insurance in order to state whether or not we wanted to be buried or cremated. I was able to um, protect all of our rights to do that in a variety of ways through our own forms, through our lawyers, through contracts, and through our family members by advocating that the language need to be all inclusive and allow that for all of us rather than just buying. So that was a consumer protection type thing. And I think it's very important to just be able to read and catch those kind of issues. And I'm uh, capable of doing that. Thank you. I've never uh, been an elected officer in Helena yet, but I was in a small delegation that went to Helena and talked then Judy Martz, governor, into getting on board with the Superfund cleanup at the Bonner Mill site, or Bonner Superfund site. And I've gone to Helena and testified on quite a few park issues since that time to help keep park funding going. And that's pretty much my experience. There's, there's not enough male uh, feminists out there that are taking the, the right stance on this issue. Uh, and that's something that I think needs to change. Uh, and I'm a, uh, a vehement supporter of women's rights. As far as how I would vote, uh, that, that's really for the woman to decide. I'll listen to them and see what they have to say because I really have no uh, business making those sorts of decisions for someone where I, I, I have no experience in that. Listen to the woman. <laughs> yes, well. <laughs> I have a very long history with this. It's the first issue I got involved with politically and why I decided to be involved in the legislature because I decided the legislature could decide whether women were going to live or die related to um, the issue of reproductive rights. So I began lobbying on reproductive rights back in the uh, 1970s. And uh, I'm a founder of NARAL. I've been on the board for both NARAL and Planned Parenthood. What are you talking about? He thinks it's off. Yeah. 
Is it off? It That's is off. Cool. It was clicked off. Thank you, Michael. Um, so as the founder of both NARAL and the Reproductive Rights Coalition, I have worked and lobbied on this issue for many decades and will, of course, and have also dealt with the strategies that are required to defeat the many attempts to restrict women's right to choose. Everything from, I love the bill, like we dealt with a couple sessions ago that would require ultrasounds, and I was able to use the analogy that a mandatory ultrasound was actually a sexual assault under our sexual assault statutes, which was not an argument they were expecting to hear, but it did manage to kill the bill because people were horrified at the idea that we'd be requiring under state law women to have an invasive procedure with ultrasound uh, against their will and against the doctor's best interest. So I am the grandmother of reproductive rights in Montana. All right, I don't think you're going to see a lot of disagreement on this issue amongst the people sitting here. I think we all agree that women are probably the best choice at deciding their own matters, and now it just comes to convincing Republicans the same thing. And uh, I think it's pretty no-brainer that women, and if it's an underage girl, their parents can decide this on their own. And uh, I think Republicans just they need some sense talked into them, and we can do that. Really, I agree with everybody else. I don't know if um, Willis wants to, I mean, I'm pro-choice. I support a woman's right to choose. I'm an unequivocal supporter of a woman's right to make their own choice. Now, one other thing that happened this past year was um, the bill or the law that forced children to talk to their parents prior to getting an abortion. As a classroom teacher and as a person who worked with a lot of teenagers, um, I, I find that very uh, repulsive to, to require, a, to um, force a child to talk to a parent who the parent nor the child could talk to each other. And it was, it was um, I think, in many ways, an abomination. Um, I vehemently oppose the law, and I hope there's some way we can change it, because um, you can't, by court order, force people to talk when they can't talk in the first place in dysfunctional families. Healthcare decisions are some of the most personal and private decisions that anybody has to make, and reproductive health care especially, and women need to be making these decisions. They have the constitutional right to do that, and we as legislators uh, have to fulfill our obligations to protect the Constitution and a woman's right to choose what happens with her own reproductive systems and her health care, and I would oppose any attempts to limit that in any way. I've been married for quite a while. I know how to survive. Let those women make their own decisions about their health care. I also support uh, a woman's right to choose under, you know, this is one of those things where I think Heather's right. I mean, we're all going to agree on this issue. Um, I will point out that my wife works for, my wife Jamie works for a little nonprofit called Women's Voices for the Earth. So I'm very in tune with issues that affect women in their everyday lives, and I will pay strict attention to that, I'm sure, um, during the next legislative session. Yeah. Thank you. The next person up first, I believe, is Diane, who, let's start with this question. And this is, um, I'm going to take a little I'm going to make this question a yes or no, or I don't know what that is question. The question is, would you support expanding the local option sales tax to communities that are not designated already as a tourist community? Local option sales tax, St. Regis has a local option sales tax, Big Sky, I believe, West Yellowstone, Red Lodge, and a couple of other communities have a local option sales tax. Would you support expanding the local option sales tax to other communities, specifically Missoula, Yes, no, or I don't know what that is. Yes. If they choose it, they should have it. I'm going to say no on that one. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. That's all done. Well, 
I think taxes are always more complicated than yes or no, but under, under, under the question, I believe I would say no. If the people in that community want that, and then it's, I say yes. I've actually spoken with uh, Mayor Engen about this very issue um, right before he decided to endorse me for HC89, and I fully support the local option. Yes, if the local option so decides. Thanks. This next question is in regards to, I believe we start with Greg next time. What can the legislature do about coal use in China? Coal use in China. Uh, well, I lived in China for five years. I moved there after I graduated from the University of Montana in 2008. And uh, blue sky days were rare. We did not see those. We saw white skies from all the, ca the coal factories. And I don't think legislation can do anything to stop them because they're going to do just what they want. And, and the idea that America is going to do anything to stop China, I think, is rather silly. Uh, what we can do is maybe some things like Washington, where you can ensure that Montana is able to produce coal and send it to China, but they're just going to get it from somewhere else like Africa. The main thing is you have to find other alternatives for these people who rely on coal for their income. Right now, they have no other jobs or no other kind of prospects, and we're sure not helping them find it. In the legislature, we could do that, and I sure, I sure hope we do that in the next session. So what I think that um, the Montana legislature can do about the coal use in China is to not export um, any coal. Uh, also, um, you know, develop other bases for our economic growth and sustainability. Well, one thing we could do is protect the communities where the coal is being shipped through. We'll wait and see what the state of Washington does with their coal ports. I'd be really surprised that Washington State is going to approve these massive um, uh, offloading uh, off facilities. But the one thing the legislature could do right now, and that is raise this coal severance tax to 40% for all coal that goes to China. We can make something out of it. I think when we ask what we can do about what somebody else does, we should ask ourselves, what are we all doing about um, the problem that that coal does create? Um, my understanding is, is that in China there is huge growth, and so they're using a lot of coal, but they're also very much uh, transferring a lot of their energy into alternative energy styles, and they're actually in many ways ahead of us in uh, developing alternative energy. Um, and I think what we want to do is say, how do we both, um, how do we work with the energy needs that we all need and the uh, dependencies that we have so that we all move forward into um, the future in a more sustainable way? Willis brought up a good point with raising the coal severance tax. I attended one of Dr. Steve Running's lectures, and I believe he stated that we're selling coal at six dollars a ton. That's right. You can't buy gravel for that. That's right. Thank you. 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 Thank having promoted such an industrial powerhouse, that, and we do have the resources, uh, Sam mentioned earlier, um, we can be a leader in the 21st century. And I think we need, as a legislator, I would push very hard. I wrote a master's thesis over at the University of Montana about alternative energy. And so I, I'm knowledgeable about the topic, and I think we need to invest in those sorts of technologies instead of relying on the fossils. <clears throat> yeah, Sam Thompson, uh, HD89 again. Uh, and, and just to refresh, it's what we can do about China's growing demand for coal, correct? That's a question. Uh, the question was, what can the legislature do about coal use in China? So yeah, so quite frankly, we can't do anything about coal use in China. China's going to figure that out for themselves. What we can do is, like Willis was saying earlier, we can make sure we don't get the short end of the stick. 
uh, with these boom and bust economies coming through. You know, we need to make sure that Montanans are, are whether that's for state tax dollars or uh, you know privately owned. I, I I honestly I don't think large corporations in the state of Montana are taxed enough. Uh, they're you know it's a it's a very small portion of our economy. They're not the job creators. They're the ones who are sending coal out of the state and polluting our air from across the ocean. So we need to make sure that they're given their uh, our fair share of state tax dollars. So. There's a lot I think the legislature can actually do, but a couple of things it can do is prepare for the transition away from coal. And part of that's going to have to be developing uh, retraining programs for people who work and for those communities that are really at this point dependent on not just coal, but oil and gas development as well. And the oil and gas industry should be bearing the cost of the development that's going on in eastern Montana where I grew up by, for one thing, getting rid of the tax holiday for the oil and gas industry. They should be paying the taxes that they need to pay in order to sustain the infrastructure and the other needs that we have for those communities. And then for our larger communities who are doing coal and other things, we need to start retraining those workers in appropriate and other fields. And the university system should be really spending its time, or some of its research time, in developing these alternative technologies that so desperately need to be out there so that we can use energy more efficiently. Thanks. Um, there are a few representatives that come to my mind that could work with both, uh, that could work with Republicans, um, that were well respected by both sides. This question is in regards to how would you work with Republicans to get laws passed, and how would you work in a bipartisan manner? I believe we're starting with Heather. Yeah. Yes, please. So I would invite my mom to come to the legislature because she is um, a very, very staunch Republican. I would, um, I would actually um, use some of the skills that I learned growing up with a woman whom I love so much, um, but disagree with on basically every ideological point. Um, you know, some of those skills um, have made me a phenomenal listener, and I feel like that's one of the talents that I have um, in working well with groups of people with disparate um, beliefs and backgrounds. And that is, I feel like, if you listen long enough, you hear what each other has to say, eventually it, you can boil down to something um, you know, that, that you both care about and, and go from there. I agree with Heather. Uh, my mother is a staunch Republican, but when it comes to her little Willie, she's bipartisan. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> but anyway <coughs> I think um, that's true, but there's one other thing that that is lacking in the legislature, and it's that five-letter word called trust, okay? It's a matter of people working with each other and knowing that you're not trying to undermine, backstab, undo what somebody else has done. And I think that's, if you look at what's happened in the last four years especially, is we've seen a lack of trust. And it takes a long time to build, it can come crashing down, you know, instantaneously. But it's a long process. As a classroom teacher for, again, I hate to beat this in the head, 30 years, I had 150 kids each day that I had to say, you know, we got to hammer things out, work things out, and it required trust. I too, having my uh, roots go back to 1860 in Montana um, and having half of every generation remain in Montana, I'm related to many, many Republicans in the state of Montana. Um, I really have such a passion for the basic needs that, and the basic interests that we all share that I do have a hard time believing that at its core that we can't find common ground to address the challenges that we face. I do think that we've gotten into a um, sort of lock stop, but I, I think that the more we can encourage participation by people to come forward and say what they really want, and I guess I'll give an example on health care. The people of Montana voted, even in all Republican counties, for health care for free for children. And the Republicans in the legislature said, we're not going, we don't want to honor that. 
commitment that or that demand of the people. And I think if we bring the people back into the legislature and get them uh, and spend more time listening to their needs and trying to meet their needs that we can find common ground. I believe in communication. People get preconceived ideas on what the other person is thinking. You need to communicate openly, talk to each other, find common ground and work from that point. Uh, first thing I'll say is that the Montana Democratic Party has done a great job. Um, hopefully there will be fewer Republicans in the next legislative session. Um, there's a candidate and running for every office, so we're excited maybe we will be a little closer to uh, uh, the majority this year. I think everybody said, uh, touched on one thing, and that's communication um, and trust with other people. Um, there are people on the other side of the aisle um, who are more than willing to work with central ideas that are for the benefit of the state of Montana. Um, and that's not something that I, I think people are routinely gonna agree, disagree with. Um, it's the people who are the stalking horses for the more radical fringes of the other party that I think are more scary. And um, personally, I don't have a great deal of interest in negotiating with them about much of anything, but um, that's just my own personal preference. <clears throat> Yeah, so uh, again, Sam Thompson, H E eighty nine. It's gonna sound like a broken record up here. Uh, you know, I, I have some experience with student government here uh, at the University of Montana, really seeing past partisan divides and, and getting things done uh, when it needs to get done. The you know, there's an interesting statistic where it says about fifty to sixty percent of Americans uh, consider themselves independent. Those same people also go on party lines every year. So what do we take from that? We take that at, the, uh, at a certain point, the majority of us agree that there needs to be a time when politics needs to be set aside. Uh, we need to build that trust like Lewis was talking about and, and really work on making things better for all Montanans. Uh, so I, I think if you instead focus on where you're united instead of where you're divided, uh, that's how you really get things done. And that's how I would carry that attitude up towards the legislature. Well, I perhaps have a slightly different point of view, although I do get a lot of bills passed working with Republicans. And I think the issue there is largely relationships and respect. Those are very important in having integrity. And most of the legislative work is not partisan. It's just work. It's figuring out um, how many of X can you do or how long should someone serve in a sense. And those really aren't partisan kinds of issues. But at the end, many of the issues the legislature faces are deeply, deeply uh, divisive and people have very fundamentally different points of view on them and they need to be respected and understood. And there is no finding in many cases compromises on those underlying fundamental differences. They are winner take all, the Republicans are in control, they will have control. But finding where you can work together is fine. But to think that just by trying to find common ground you'll be able to get past those divides the Republicans at this point believe less government, in fact, very little government, is the way to go. Democrats tend to believe there is a role for government to be involved in things. Those are very different points of view and not ones that can be resolved by uh, trying to get along. So in the end, politics really is a power, power game. And you need to do it respectfully. People you may not agree with, but you need to work with people respectfully around those issues. But there are fundamental differences, and they will be there regardless. Uh, when it comes to working with people from the other party, I guess I'll listen to them, let them talk a lot, and listen and find the uh, chinks in their ideological armor and try to hit them with my own beliefs and ideas so I can influence their vote over to my cause. <laughs> <laughs>